Good evening. Thank you so much for joining us here. I'm Brian Mays. And I'm Quita Culpepper. Tonight, we're keeping you updated on the 2020 election results. We'll be bringing you the very latest at KVU.com, the KVU Facebook page, and of course, our YouTube channel throughout the night tonight. And in addition to those results, we're giving you context on the races, plus analysis from political experts. Now, already, the Associated Press has named projected winners in a few states. They're saying the president, Donald Trump, has projected or is projected to win Kentucky and West Virginia at this hour. Joe Biden expected to take West uh, Virginia and Vermont. We'll keep you updated as we learn more results throughout the evening here. Now, we're still waiting for the first round of local results to come into us. But in the meantime, Ross Ramsey joins us. He's the executive editor and co-founder of the Texas Tribune. And Ross, thank you so much for being with us tonight. You bet. It's a pleasure. All right, off the bat here, Ross. Polls closed about an hour ago on the East Coast. We talked a little bit about some states they're already projecting. What we're seeing right now probably not going to be where things stand at the end of the night, but what are your early impressions of the way the night is beginning along the East Coast? It's, you know, it's all the states that they're calling now are the states that you could have called yesterday. Um, and the states that really are the ones to watch on the east coast are florida georgia north carolina pennsylvania is going to be a slow count and then ohio and then they're going to get into the middle of the country and one of the weird things about texas this year is that we used to be one of the states that you could count quickly but it's very competitive here and i think uh, texas results should be pretty quick but i think going to be pretty close now, Ross, I know we don't have the total number of votes cast today in Texas just yet, but our state did see pretty high voter turnout during early voting. 9.7 million people actually cast their ballots early. That's more than the total number of votes cast in the entire 2016 presidential election. So do you think the high early voting turnout will have a pretty huge effect on the outcome of this election? Uh, sure. I think, you know, part of the reason that the turnout is higher is because the state's grown so much and Texas is bigger. It has more voters in it. But voters are also very enthusiastic this year um, on both sides and showed it in the early vote turnout. I'm curious to see how many people voted on Election Day, whether the state's up in the 10 and a half, 11, maybe even 12 million million vote range. Um, and the, the folklore in Texas has been for years that a bigger turnout is less and less red. We'll see if it actually turns blue. All right, definitely something to watch. And Ross, thank you for being here with us tonight. Always a pleasure. All right, let's talk about Williamson County. Uh, as you can see, Tony Plahetsky has joined us live here on our election coverage. We're talking about the race for sheriff, Tony, in Williamson County. The incumbent, of course, Robert Chody, Mike Gleason challenging him for that seat. I know you've been very close to this race throughout the night. What are you seeing early on, Tony, and what are you expecting as we get through the evening in Williamson County? So, Brian, this is really significant. You know, one of the things that we've been talking about all afternoon is that Democrats in Williamson County, County have been saying that they hope this is their night. And I want to tell you that based on early voting results in Williamson County, they are getting their wish. Uh, in the race for sheriff, which is the one that we have been talking about uh, most, Sheriff Robert Chody has received 33% of the votes. You can see it there on your screen. Mike Gleason is uh, so far well ahead with 60 almost 67 percent of the vote there uh, in Williamson County. So this is a huge, huge upset uh, in that race. A lot of people were predicting that that race was going to be close, but if, if this stays uh, close to the way it is right now, it is going to be a landslide in favor of Mike Gleason over the incumbent, Sheriff Robert Chody. But Brian and Quita, I just want to tell you as I scroll through all of these results in Williamson County, um, it is blue, blue, blue. So let me just walk you through a few of those. Another race that we've been watching in Williamson County is that of Williamson County Attorney. It so far is uh, going to a Democrat. Also some judicial races, for example, um, also going to Democrats. And Brian and Quita, I just want to tell you, based on the margins that I'm seeing, 
these are not close. This is very, very significant. And it is a major uh, upset for the Republican Party if this continues to hold. Keep in mind, as we've been say, seeing, uh, pardon me, I'm putting my laptop down. As we've been saying, uh, Republicans have not elected, or excuse me, have had a stronghold in Williamson County for 25 years. Uh, Democrats have been over time, particularly over the past several years, gaining more and more ground in Williamson County particularly as the demographics have changed. But the county has not elected a Democrat to a county-wide position in 25 years. So that is today, tonight, and this particular election cycle is, is a major change uh, for Williamson County. Again, a change really being ushered in as more people move into Williamson County, more Austinites move into Williamson County, many of them Demo uh, Democrats. We've seen entire neighborhoods spring up really since the 2018 race. But uh, again, when you look at a county that has a law and order legacy uh, and a Republican stronghold legacy over many, many years and in fact decades, we're on the path for a major upset and a major sea change in Williamson County, Texas tonight. And we should mention as well, Tony, early, early voting in here, those numbers, of course, going to go up. A significant amount of early voting took place in Williamson County, given the extra week we had for early voting this year. Of course, today's turnout from people I've heard from wasn't really that heavy, as many were expecting. Maybe it's because so many people voted early. Uh, who knows how that plays out? But as you said, the early returns are, uh, are now looking more popular positive for the Democratic candidates, at least the ones that you're seeing. Yeah, and of course, Brian and Quita, these numbers could change overnight. Mm -hmm. Experts will tell you that over time, early voting particularly uh, is, is more Democrats vote in early voting than on election day. Uh, but I tell you, even if many Republicans went to the polls today, this is still going to be a major sea change potentially for Williamson County. But it'll be interesting to see if those numbers actually hold up throughout the rest of the night. Again, but Republicans those have a lot of ground to make up if, if they want to win some of these races, Quita. They definitely do. Thank you, Tony. We'll be following along. Tony, we'll check in with you in just a little bit. Joining us now for analysis tonight, Sherry Greenberg. She's a professor at UT's LBJ School of Public Affairs, and she served as a Texas state representative from 1991 to 2001. Professor Greenberg, thank you so much for taking the time with us tonight. My pleasure to be with you. Well, let's get right to it. A lot of people wondering if the state house will flip tonight. We know that nine seats were kind of in between the Democrats and the Republicans in control uh, from what you've seen and heard tonight. Uh, what are you thinking and what's it going to take for the Democrats to make up that ground? I'm thinking that there's a great possibility that, in fact, uh, it will flip. We saw in the last cycle that the Democrats picked up 12 seats. They need to pick up nine now. But we're starting to um, hear you know, some exits. We're starting to get some returns. And the Democrats have been very strong. We know that in a lot of these areas, the demographics have been changing. These are areas that maybe were suburban and are now more urban or exurban and now suburban. Also, we know that in some of these suburbs, uh, there has been a big change in the composition. They're no longer just homogeneous. You have people of all races, ethnicities, ages, uh, political pre uh, persuasions uh, living there. Well, Sherry, the next legislative session set to start in January and redistricting, a huge deal. It's on the agenda. If the Democrats do take control of the House, what sort of effect will that have on the process? Well, if the Democrats take control of the House, it will have a big effect because, of course, that means that for the first time in many years, the Speaker of the House would be a Democrat. And uh, the Speaker is very, very important in the Texas House. The Speaker appoints the chairs of the committees and the members of the committees and, of course, uh, calendars and controlling legislation. So it will be huge. All Professor right. Sherry Greenberg, thank you so much for your time tonight. We appreciate you taking the time to talk with us uh, here on KV this evening. Thank you. Glad to be with you. And Terry Gruca is joining us now.
Terry, you've been tracking the U.S. Senate race. A lot of eyes here in the state of Texas on this race, but really nationally. Uh, John, John Cornyn, the incumbent, MJ Hagar, the challenger. How are things looking? Yeah, let's take a look at the early results that we have in here right now. We only have 16% of the places reporting right now, and right now John Cornyn with 49% of the vote to MJ Hagar's 48%. This is why this is significant. You know, MJ Hagar has not held a public seat yet here in the state of Texas, but she had a really strong showing in 2018 when she ran against John Carter, and that was a super close race. So a lot of people have speculated that this too could be, in fact, a close race. You've got millions more people who now live in this state, and, and this is why this is crucial. I think, you know, we talk a lot uh, about Williamson County, the Travis County area. Austin in particular has seen a huge influx of people moving out of the city and into these suburbs. And the suburbs and these outerlying areas have tended to be really strongholds for Republicans. So when you look at some of the results, this is from the 2016 presidential race and how these various counties voted. It kind of shows you that the state obviously traditionally votes Republican. But if you take a look a little bit closer at some of these counties, what you have seen, what we've seen in the past is these bigger areas, Austin, Houston, um, even Dallas area, tending to vote more Democratic. But take Case County, for instance. In 2016, 47% of people there voted for Trump, 46% for Clinton, so super close in Hayes County during the last presidential election. Williamson County, 52% voted for Trump, 42% for Clinton. So as we are getting more people moving into these communities, we're starting to see shifts in how people vote, which is why there's so much interest in Texas right now. So we're going to continue to keep our eye on these races. These are still early polling results, and so I want people to take that, uh, you know, with what that's worth. Um, we've got over, you know, 39% uh, of the people that um, we're looking at in some of these races right now, but that's about the most that we've seen so far coming in. And Terry, I know both of these candidates have differing opinions about energy policy and COVID vaccinations. They do. They talked a lot about it in their debates. Um, I know John Cornyn, for example, talked a lot about oil and gas as well as fracking and how uh, he said that MJ Hagar wanted to do away with fracking. MJ Hagar obviously wants to mandate the COVID vaccine um, once it is put out. John Cornyn does not. So it'll be interesting to see who shows up at the polls tonight. All right, Terry Gruca, thank you for being with us. We'll see you a little bit later. And we are starting to see the first election returns for the presidential race. Remember, nothing is set in stone just yet, as Brian was about to say. And a lot of what we're seeing right now is from the early voters and people who voted by mail. Let's take a look. We have got Joe Biden here with 51 percent, with 16 percent of the voters reporting. The incumbent, President Donald Trump, 47 percent. You can see just how close this race is right now. And of course, Joe Jorgensen, 1 percent. Howie Hawkins, another. 442 will send the link with those results right to your phone. And we're going to keep you updated on the latest election results on KVU on air and online throughout the night. And we'll see you again for another update coming up at about 730.
out here at the Cedar Park Public Library, over 25,000.
Good evening, just after 7.30 here on KVU. Uh, thank you for joining us. I'm Brian May. And I'm Quita Culpepper. And tonight we're keeping you updated on the 2020 election results. Going to bring you the very latest, of course, here at KVU.com, also on the KVU Facebook page and our YouTube channel throughout the night tonight. And in addition to those results, we're giving you context on the races, plus analysis from experts. Oh, already, the Associated Press has named projected winners in a couple of states so far. Projections show President Donald Trump with 55 electoral, electoral votes. Joe Biden expected to get 85 votes, those electoral votes coming in. Of course, these very, very early numbers. We'll keep you updated as soon as we learn more, of course, throughout the evening here. And happening right now, Travis County Clerk Dana DeBeauvoir is giving an update on the election. Let's listen in. Voting for the rest of their lives. Dana, did you see any problems at any of the polling places? It was so minuscule. You know, there was a couple of places where a couple of voters didn't wear a mask. And voters just sort of kept their distance from those people. Uh, and we all got through it just fine. For the most part, voters were very careful and very respectful of one another. I just am so proud of Travis County voters. Talk about this process we're going to be going through tonight and getting all the ballots here. Yes. What happens is, is that you're seeing ballot boxes coming in from each of the vote centers. Um, so they come through this way. They have a, uh, a tick-off process that you go through. We want to make sure that we have all of the equipment and all of the backup paperwork. So we check off everything there. The backup materials go to the warehouse and all of the counting materials go to the counting station, which is in this front part of the building. All right, having some technical issues with the Travis County Clerk, Dana DeBouvois. You heard just a little bit about her. She was talking about uh, the way things went today on Election Day. No huge issues to talk about there. So it's nice to hear that things went fairly smoothly on this very, very busy day in Travis County. Matt McCobiak joins us now with some analysis on how things are looking. That's right. Matt is the chairman of the Travis County Republican Party. And Matt... Thank you so much for being with us tonight. I know things are busy for you. Good to see you. Well, Texas has been reliably a red state for quite a while now, but some analysts are calling Texas a toss-up state. In your opinion, is there any chance that Democrats will win the presidency or the U.S. Senate race? No, I think Trump's going to win Texas. We analyzed the, uh, the vote through early voting, and he's up. He was up about 100,000 raw votes. And he's going to win decisively across the state on election day. So I expect him to be in the four or five, maybe six percent range in terms of the statewide margin. John Cornyn is going to overperform the president by a few points. So he's going to win by seven to nine percent. The action is down ballot in the congressional races, in the state house races, in one of the state Senate races. That's what's going to be most competitive. Which races do you see, Matt, to be the most competitive right now as you look down the ballot at some of those congressional races? Yeah, there's eight or nine of them, honestly, that both sides are hotly contesting. I mean, I would put Congressional District 21, which is, of course, part of Travis County with Chip Roy and Wendy Davis. That is going to be a barn burner. Uh, it's about 1% right now separating them. It's going to be very, very, very close. Uh, I'm involved in the Texas 23, this Congressional District 23 race between Tony Gonzalez and Gene Ortiz Jones. I believe Tony will win, but it's going to be close as well. <clears throat> there are others in Houston and Dallas, excuse me, that are going to be very competitive. So we'll see uh, whether the, the Democrats can pick up a few congressional seats tonight. All right, Matt, let's talk a little bit about Austin's city council races. Half of the council seats up for election tonight. This could sort of be, I guess, a referendum on issues like homelessness and policing here in Austin. Yeah, we've looked at the early votes so far, and it appears that two of the three competitive races are going to go to runoffs, which is a very good outcome. District 6 and District 10, District 6 with Jimmy Flanagan, the incumbent, uh, and the challenger, Mackenzie Kelly, are pretty pretty close, actually. I think it's 38-35 right now. Uh, District 10 is also very close. Uh, you're going to see Allison Alter, the incumbent, get pulled into a runoff by Jennifer Verdon, uh, first-time candidate. We've got 25%. I think uh, Alter's around 35 or maybe 38%. So you're going to have two December runoffs, and I think those issues are going to be front and center. If people are tired of the police budget cut, if they're tired of the homelessness crisis that we're seeing everywhere across our city, they have an opportunity to elect uh, two uh, outstanding pro-taxpayer candidates uh, in the runoffs. All right, Matt Makoviak, thank you so much for your time. It's always a pleasure to visit with you, especially on a busy night like tonight. Enjoy the rest of the evening. Take care.
All right, now we are turning to Terry Gruca. She is joining us now. Try tracking the U.S. Senate race. Of course, Terry, we've talked a lot about this one, uh, not just from a Texas perspective, but from a national perspective. MJ Hagar challenging John Cornyn. How are things looking? Let's take a look at the numbers that we have right now for you. Uh, this is the Senate race here in uh, Texas. And, you know, John Cornyn is the longtime incumbent. He stands... Uh, uh, to hopefully win this seat for the Republicans. They're looking right now at 50% of the vote against MJ Hagar, 48%. And I'm trying to see how many precincts are reporting. I apologize, I'm gonna have to move so I can see. 29% of the precincts reporting right now um, across the state. So again, still early on in this race, they knew this was going to be a close race between MJ Hagar and John Cornyn, both of them. Uh, very, I think, um, Tough on a lot of different issues, but also very different on a lot of the issues. John Cornyn here taking a, a big stand against the defunding of the police situation. MJ Hagar taking a stand on the handling of the COVID situation. And this is a look at how Republicans voted in the 2016 election and why this U.S. Senate race is so key right now in this presidential election. It is because a lot of these counties, especially even around our area in Central Texas, that tend to vote more Republican are trending again toward Democratic votes because you're getting people moving out of the Austin area into these outer lying areas, into Hayes County, into Williamson County. So you're starting to see the blueberry in the strawberry pie, as they call it here in Texas, spread into some of these outer lying counties. And it is why, for instance, in Hayes County, 47% of the people voted for Trump during the last presidential election, 46% for Clinton. So we'll just have to wait to see as we get more of these votes in tonight. All right, and I know the two candidates have uh, differing opinions on energy policies and COVID vaccinations. A lot of different opinions on both of those issues, Quita, talking a lot about fracking that was mentioned in their debates uh, earlier in this election process. They also talked um, a lot about how they see things differently from the police standpoint. Uh, John Cornyn talking about he didn't want defunding of the police. MJ Hagar talking about how she wanted to see some of the funds that the police were getting be used in different ways. So again, very political issues for both parties and a lot of the reasons why so many voters are heading to the polls. A lot of early votes cast, no doubt. We'll see how that one plays out the rest of the night. Terry, thanks a lot. We'll check back in with you in just a bit. And Brian, it looks like we're starting to see more results come in. All right, let's take a look at some of those right now. In fact, as we get these results in, we'll, of course, bring them to you as soon as we know uh, what's happening here. Let's take a look at the unit. The uh, representative of Congressional District 10, Mike Siegel, challenging Michael McCall, the Republican incumbent. As you can see, uh, just about half of the precincts reporting 51 percent McCall with just just a few less votes. Actually, it's very close. 150,502 to 147,848. 49% for both. This race, as Matt Makoviak was talking about, a very close race, no doubt. We're seeing that with about half the votes in uh, tonight on Congressional District 10. Other uh, races we're keeping an eye on tonight. Of course, a lot of congressional districts uh, involved in this busy, busy election night. This for Congressional District 11. Only 6% of votes uh, in at this point, Austin Fluger with a huge lead in the early vote count over John Mark Hogg, Wacy Cody coming in with just about 1% of the vote uh, as we talk to you at this hour. Of course, many of these races still very early on, as we talked about just 6% of the vote there. Uh, Congressional District 17, Rick Kennedy, the Democrat, uh, with 52% of the vote early on. Uh, Pete Sessions, of course, the Republican with 45% of the early vote, 29% reporting as of uh, this hour here as we approach the 8 o'clock hour. Uh, not too many votes in just yet, but you can kind of see how things are going in Congressional District 17 uh, as we move through the night here uh, and these votes continue to come in. 52% uh, for Rick Kennedy, 45% uh, for Pete Sessions. As we look through other results tonight, Quita, I'm not sure exactly what's next, uh, but we'll play it by ear. How about District 27? Nope, we're not going to do that one. Oh, I'm going to let gonna you do that, do that one. I've talked All way right. too much, Quita. <laughs> All right, I will take a look at U.S. Representative District 27. As you can see, incumbent Michael Cloud, the Republican here, 74% with over 13,000 votes so far. And the Democrat, Ricardo De La Fuente, with 25% of the vote tonight. Phil Gray, the Libertarian, 1%. So 11% right now reporting in this particular race. And the incumbent, John Carter, we're looking at District uh, 31 now, the incumbent Republican John Carter, 52 percent. 
Donna Imam, 46%. So a very close race in U.S. Representative District 31 with 71% reporting. Okay. And Clark Patterson, 2%. So as you can see right now, John Carter has the lead in this particular race. Let's take a look at Austin Prop A. This has been a controversial one. It would cost billions of dollars to build a transportation system in and around Austin. Now, it looks like 58% of Austin voters are for Prop A at this time. This is all from early voting. We have to remember that. 42% against. So right now, with the early voting results, Prop A looks to be voters look to be for Prop A with 58% of the vote. Now, I'm not sure what's coming up next. Do we have any more results coming in? We do, Quita. Actually, we do. <laughs> it's kind of fun to do this on the fly, isn't it? Let's talk about Prop B, of course. This is the other bond, $460 million in bond. This is mobility as well. You can see here with the early vote total, 68% in favor of Prop B, only 32% against that. Looks to be overwhelming right now in favor. Again, early vote count here, so we've got a long way to go on this proposition as we head through the night. Of course, these two propositions, uh, all to do with infrastructure and light rail and sidewalks and bikeway. So we're talking about that uh, as we move forward. Let's talk about the council seats up for grabs. We heard Matt McCoviak talk a little bit about this. Uh, this a four-way race in District 6 uh, in Austin. Early vote count in 41 percent for Jimmy Flanagan. Of course, that's his seat. He's had it uh, for a couple of years now. Mackenzie Kelly, Jennifer Mushtaller, D. Harrison, all receiving votes there. Uh, but it's really coming down to the top two. You can see here uh, between Flanagan and Kelly at this point, 41 percent for Flanagan uh, as we look toward the early early vote uh, in council district number six here in Austin uh, on this election night. We've got some other results to bring you as well, and we'll talk about those throughout the evening as they just pop up. We'll just mention them, but we don't have any more to tell you about right now, Quita. So that's all, uh, all I have for council and for Prop B. Back to you, Quita. All right. Thank you, Brian. And everybody stay up to date on all the latest election results and text the word elections to 512-459-9442, and we will send you a link to the results on our website. It's kind of fun being part of this. You it know, is, I, I like haven't this. done this is the first time I've done an election night, Quita. Well, welcome to election night. It's very exciting for me. We'll be back on KVU.com, of course, the KVU Facebook page. And don't forget the YouTube channel as well. We'll be back with you about eight o'clock. That's what about uh, 15 minutes from now right. we'll have more results.
I'm here with y'all. Is something happening tonight? We don't know. Uh, but don't know. Ed, I wanted to ask you, for the past few decades, Republicans have been able to claim Texas as a red state. Of course, Democrats trying to change that tonight. Do you think that's going to happen? Well, look, it's so far it's looking very promising. Right now what we're seeing is that the uh, advantage that Republicans have held in the suburbs in Texas has been neutralized. You've seen that in Williamson County where Joe Biden is leading. You're seeing it in Hayes County where he's leading there as well. But go up to North Texas as well. Places like Collin County and Tarrant County. These are places where Republicans used to run up the score. That's not the case tonight. Tonight, Tarrant County is within 700 votes and Collin County is within about 15,000. Those are very small margins when you consider the fact that uh, Biden is gonna run up the score in places like Travis, Dallas, and even Harris. Let's talk down the ballot just a step, Ed, about the Senate race from Texas. Of course, uh, MJ Hagar spent a lot of money uh, in this race. John Cornyn's had the seat since 2002. It appears, like with the presidential race in Texas, uh, a lot of Democrats showed up to vote in this one. Mm. Yeah, this is going to be a, a real close race, just like the presidential one, a real nail biter, or as uh, someone once said, tighter than two coats of paint. What you're seeing <laughs> here is, is John Cornyn, who has been in office for three terms, but never really polled very high. In fact, throughout the entirety of this race, never once polled above 50%. And you see him creeping above that tonight, but that's not a comfortable, comfortable position for somebody who's a three-term senator to be in. So this could go long we, we, we may not know the outcome to this one uh anytime soon well ed let's talk a little bit about house district 48 with the incumbent donna howard that race what's going on in that one uh i to be honest with you i haven't seen the numbers in that one it's, uh, it's supposed to be a safe seat um that's all i can say about that <laughs> <laughs> okay we're being told Donna Howard 71%, so you hit the nail on the head. A strong, okay, all right. uh, a strong <laughs> I'm glad we could. Something I was supposed to know about that maybe came up, crept up on us. But, hey, uh, <laughs> and that's why they pay us the big bucks to give some of the news to you. So we're proud to do that with you uh, here tonight. Down the ballot, what races, uh, as we f finish up with you, Ed, here, what races are you really looking at closely that have been held by a Republican that might just flip tonight, both at the congressional level and the state level? Are there some you're really focusing on? Yeah, so let's look at the let's look at the congressional level because there's one that you talked about a minute ago, which is Congressional District 25. That's Julie Oliver, Democrat, running in that seat against Roger Williams. It is the epitome of a of a gerrymandered district. It goes from Circle C to Cherrywood, up to near Fort Worth. <laughs> it's a sprawling district, mm -hmm. and the early numbers show that Julie Oliver is leading there. So that's that is one to watch. The other one is Congressional District 21 which is Wendy Davis running against Chip Roy. Chip Roy, the first term incumbent, just won that seat in 2018. And as of the early returns tonight, Wendy Davis leads by 13 points. Now, that could change because that's not just an Austin seat. That's also a seat that goes down I-35 into San Antonio and into Hill Country. So we have, you know, Wendy has a comfortable lead right now, but those two seats are ones to keep an eye on. Interesting point on the congressional seats in Texas, there are seven or eight of them that are being challenged right now. If Democrat win, if Democrats win five of those seats, we are looking at a Texas delegation that is split 50 50 wow. in Congress. Let that sink in. That's the kind of night that we're seeing right now. Wow. <laughs> that that's that's a lot to take in actually the times they are changing yeah <laughs> all, all right. right ed espinosa with project texas thank you thank you so much for being with us tonight thanks for having me good to be here and tony flohetsky joins us now for a look at the race for williamson county sheriff tony and Quita and Brian, you know, I was just crunching some numbers. Uh, I do want to tell you that according to Williamson County, 25,700 people voted today, election day. There were an additional 4,000 and some change 
provisional ballots cast today in Williamson County. If you look at early voting in the Williamson County Sheriff's race, Sheriff Robert Chody has 1,005, excuse me, 105,510 votes. You can see it there on your screen. Uh, and Mike Gleason had 139,884 votes. So if you add up the total number of votes today, that still does not get Robert Chody the votes that he would need to close the gap between he and Mike Gleason. So we're going to continue to watch this race. But again, if every single person, all 25,700 plus 4,000 provisional ballots were cast in Robert Chody's favor, according to my math, that is still not enough to close the gap uh, with early voting and, and allow him to overtake Mike Leeson in this race. So that is where we are right now in the Williamson County Sheriff's race. We've been talking about Williamson County all night and I've been watching some of these other races in that county as well. Right now, based on early voting, early voting, uh, Joe Biden is leading in Williamson County. Uh, there are other uh, Democrats who are in highly contested races uh, in Williamson County right now. But one thing that I do want to say, and I mentioned this earlier, is that it is not uncommon for more D's, more Democrats, to vote in early voting. And sometimes Republicans uh, can catch up uh, on Election Day, which is why I wanted to see exactly how many people voted in Williamson County today and what that might do in the race for sheriff. But that is where things stand right now. But obviously a, a big night in Williamson County and in this, in this particular race, the race for the county's top law enforcement officer. Definitely one we are going to be watching for the rest of the night. Tony Plohetsky, thank you very much. And now Terry Gruca is joining us. That's right, Terry. You've been tracking that U.S. Senate race, MJ Hagar and John Cornyn. Yeah, we were uh, listening to Ed talk a little bit about that one. That's continuing to be a close race here in Texas. And a lot of it may end up being because of what we're seeing in some of the outer lying and the suburban areas. As Tony mentioned, Williamson County playing a big role in what we're seeing election wise in some of these counties. Uh, we saw this in 2016 where a lot of these suburban counties were starting to trend more Democrat. And so again, those trends continuing as people moving out of the cities and into these suburban areas. So they're playing a greater role and Republicans not finding that they're able to rely on some of their base. And so it is why John Cornyn spent a lot of his time in some of these smaller areas um, of Texas where he has these strongholds and MJ Hagar focusing on the big cities where uh, the Democratic vote tends to be a bigger portion of that vote. Right now with about 38% of the precincts reporting John Cornyn 51% of the vote to MJ Hagar's 47% of the vote. This has been kind of teetering back and forth all night long and so we're going to continue to watch this. Both of these candidates spending millions especially here toward the end and advertising, trying to, to get that core base to show up at the polls. You know, John Cornyn has this history in the Senate. Uh, a three-term incumbent senator in the U.S. Senate has a history of working across the aisle with the Democrats, and sometimes it doesn't sit so well with Republicans, uh, and MJ Hagar kind of harping on that during this election. But he also has a really strong base when it comes to the oil and gas industry, uh, focusing a lot on the, um, he was one of the ones who voted for the stimulus package the very first one and also tried to work across the aisle to get the second stimulus passed um, but fell short of doing that before the election and so he really tried to play that up uh, to voters here at the very end. Again we're going to continue to watch this race as these votes come in. Right now only about 29% uh, uh, of the vote coming in or the precincts uh, coming in at this hour so still a lot uh, to be told with some of these outer lying areas and as we get those votes in we'll continue to share those with you. Ryan, Clita. All right, Terry, thank you very much. A close race, no doubt, as we kind of expected uh, heading into this election day. That's right. And now that it's been more than an hour since the poll closed, we can take a look at the results that we have so far. Brian, you can start it off. Let's start with the race for president, the vote in Texas. You know, we had a huge, huge early vote turnout here in the state of Texas. And these are, again, just the votes in the state, about 41% reporting 
50% of that vote to Joe Biden at this point. Not many ahead, not many votes ahead, but the incumbent, of course, President Donald Trump right behind with 49% of the vote. Again, that's the Texas vote, not the national vote. So you can see a very close race, as the experts predicted, going into this presidential election. In uh, Congressional District 10, this also a very close race. As you can see, uh, the incumbent Michael McCall and Mike Siegel, the challenger for the second time, a very close race here as well, with about 55% reporting, just over half. Uh, it's uh, a lead for McCall at this point. 25% reporting for Congressional District 11, not quite as close here. The Republican August Fluger with 77% of the vote. Again, about a quarter of the precincts reporting for Congressional District 11. And another race we're keeping an eye on tonight is in District 17. Pete Sessions and Rick Kennedy. It comes down to those two. And Sessions, the Republican, with about 52% of the vote. Again, just over half of the precincts reporting uh, for that race as we head into Congressional District 17. We also want to talk about District 21. This one is one that Ed Espinoza was mentioning earlier. And this, uh, a big lead with over half the precincts reporting, Quita, uh, District 21 right now, Wendy Davis with 55% of the vote of the incumbent, Chip Roy, 42%. Again, just over half the precincts reporting uh, in that race tonight. All right, let's take a look at District 27. Well, there we go with incumbent Michael Cloud. When 42% of the votes reported, in the incumbent, 60% of the vote at this time. Ricardo de la Fuente, the Democratic challenger, 39%. So as you can see, that race not that close right now, but again, only 42% reporting. Now with 48% reporting of the vote, incumbent Lloyd Doggett, 69% for District 35. Now his challenger, the Republican challenger, Jenny Garcia Sharon, 27% of the vote. Again, 48% reporting right now, so things could still change, but right now, Representative Doggett has a sizable lead in the District 35 race. You, of course, can stay up to date on the very latest results on our website. You can also text the word elections to 512-459-9442, and we will send a link directly to your phone. So keep watching KVU tonight for all the latest election results, and we'll be back with more updates at about 830.
Thanks for joining us tonight for KVU special election coverage. I'm Quita Culpepper. And I'm Brian Mays. Tonight we are sharing live election results with you as well as getting great analysis from experts all across the area. Now already the Associated Press has named projected winners in a few states so far. That's right. Projections showing President Donald Trump with 92 electoral votes. Joe Biden expected to be at about 119 at this hour according to ABC News. Now remember, it takes 270 electoral votes to win. So we'll keep you updated as more results roll in. And they're coming in by the minute. Jim Henson with Texas Politics Project joining us now for some analysis this evening. Hi there, Jim, and thank you so much for joining us. You're welcome. Great to be here with you all. Now, ABC is projecting incumbent Senator John Cornyn to win. He's already been declared the winner by them and by them and a few others. Now, a lot of people were wondering if MJ Hagar would be able to pull off a win. What do you think Cornyn's projected victory says about Texas? Well, you know, I think it shows that Texas is more competitive uh, than it's been in a long time. If you look at that at that gap, it's on one hand, not as close as the uh, Beto O'Rourke Ted Cruz race two years ago. Uh, on the other hand, uh, H Hagar had a, a pretty steep hill to climb. And so in this race and in others, we're seeing that while the state is more competitive, um, Republicans are holding their own in a lot of places, even if they do look like uh, in some of the state house races and in the congressional races, that they're gonna lose some ground. As we know, early voting is, is a big part of the process this year. Uh, we've seen a high number of Democratic early voters. Uh, Joe Biden, of course, uh, trying to flip Texas from red to blue. Do you think at this early stage there's uh, any indication that he's really got a chance in Texas as we look toward the rest of the night? Well, you know, Joe Biden came out looking very strong in the, in the early vote totals, which is what we expected. Uh, just in the last little bit, we've, as we've seen more of the rural counties come in uh, and some of the more outlying exurban counties, uh, President Trump has taken a slight lead in the vote. And so I think it underlines the, that the narrative that we've been talking about going into this race has always been a little simple in terms of the, the frequent discussion. Is Texas turning blue, not turning blue? The state is getting more competitive. We're going to see uh, probably a much closer outcome than we've seen in presidential elections in quite some while. But given the pattern of what votes have been counted and what votes have not been counted so far, it does look like uh, President Trump is retaining the kind of a, a, a degree of advantage that that we would expect a Republican to to to, to have. Um, but it, but we'll probably lose some ground compared to how he did in 2016 here. Now I know the Texas State House is a huge deal because redistricting is on the agenda of the next legislative session. That's going to start in January. If Democrats take control, what sort of effect could that have on that process? Well, if the Democrats take control, were to take control of the House, which is is still to be decided tonight, uh, it would give them uh, at, at least a seat at the table in the redistricting process. They'd still be at a significant disadvantage, given that given that we expect Republican majorities in the Senate, and of course, uh, the statewide offices will still be dominated by Republicans. Um, but Democrats have had virtually nothing to say about the process at the legislative level. They had to really wait and go to and challenge the Republican maps and re, uh, the Republican results in court. Were the, were the Democrats to uh, win a majority in the Texas House, they would at least um, have a, a voice in the process since at least in the, at the initial stages, the assumption is that you know, per the per the Constitution and per the rules of both chambers, uh, the redistricting maps proceed just like any other bill. So they have to be passed by both houses, signed by the governor. All right, Jim Henson with the Texas Politics Project. Thank you so much for being with us. We appreciate you taking the time to speak with us tonight. Good talking to you both. Thank you. And Terry Gruca is joining us now. Hi, there, Terry. 
Hey guys, I know we've been tracking the U.S. Senate race. You heard Jim talk a little bit about that there. So let's go ahead and look a little bit closer at the numbers. This is between Republican incumbent John Cornyn and Democrat MJ Hagar. This race has been close all night, but as you mentioned, ABC projecting John Cornyn to win. Right now, uh, even with 47, 43% of the precincts reporting, there is less than 500,000 votes separating Cornyn and Hagar. So this was a close race, but not as close as we have seen MJ Hagar get to other uh, Republicans in races where she went against uh, John Carter in 2018. But she has made quite a name for herself here in Texas. And this is probably the bigger picture here. This is from the 2016 presidential election. And you can see all the red counties there. These are the counties where incumbents like John Cornyn really count on to help support their efforts. But we've been seeing some of these red counties uh, starting to turn a little bit, including Hayes County, which during the last presidential election was super close between uh, Clinton and Trump. Uh, in fact, only a, a few hundred thousand votes separating the presidential candidates there. So again, we're watching a lot of these Hayes County, Williamson County races to see how this is going to impact more of the national races. Uh, not quite sure yet if uh, John Cornyn projecting to win means anything yet for the presidential race. We'll just have to wait as the night goes on, guys. All right. Thank you, Terry. And you know what? It's time to take a look at some more results, Brian. I that's right. We've got a lot of numbers to get through, so let's get right to it. Starting uh, with Prop A, Proposition A right here in Austin. The tax rate, the funding, $7.1 billion for light rail lines, tunnel, downtown, uh, new buses. Uh, again, that's the 8.75 cent property tax increase. And right now with the early vote in, you can see 58% uh, for Prop A, 42% against. Again, this very early on in the process, not including those votes uh, that were cast today. Prop B, another $460 million in bonds for mobility projects in Austin. 68% overwhelmingly for this. Again, with just the early vote count at this point, 32% against uh, as we look at Prop B and Prop A uh, heading into this election night. Reporting with 60 61% now in congressional district. Actually, this is state representative uh, District 48, the incumbent Donna Howard, with a significant lead. In fact, we're calling that for her. 71% of the vote, uh, Donna Howard, will retain that seat uh, in state district 48 for the state House of Representatives. In 49, it's Gina Hinojosa with 80% of the vote. Uh, the incumbent will retain that seat as well in district 49 in the state House of Representatives. District 50 in the state House of Representatives, the incumbent Celia is with 70% of the vote. She, again, a Democrat, will retain that seat uh, here in Central Texas for District 50 with just under 60,000 votes uh, in the early vote and the early count from tonight. And with 54% reporting for state representative in District 51, uh, the incumbent is Eddie Rodriguez, significant lead for him. In fact, uh, he will retain that seat uh, as he has that huge lead uh, with just over 53,000 votes in state representative District 51. Uh, here in the state of Texas. Squeedle. Oh. All right, thank you, Brian. Now it's time to take a look at the Austin City Council races. There were five council seats that were up there. And when we look at Austin City Council District 2 seat, you can see Vanessa Fuentes with 56% of the vote. She has a pretty good lead against all of her opponents tonight. These are the early votes that have been counted. Now you look at Austin City Council District 4, Greg Kazar, the incumbent, a sizable lead. It looks like he is going to be declared the winner in this particular race with 68 percent of the vote. Now, District 6, Jimmy Flanagan, the incumbent, 41 percent. Look at Mackenzie Kelly. She has 33 percent. There is still time for her to make up some of those numbers. It could be a close race. We just don't know at this point. And early voting in for District 7 with Leslie Poole, 68 percent to Morgan Witts, 32 percent. And let's see, in District 10, that's the one I was looking for, Allison Alter, 35%, Jennifer Vierden, 25%. Now you can see that this race also running close as well, so we're just gonna have to wait and see when the rest of the votes come rolling in later tonight, and we will know who is on the city council. Of course, you could stay up to date all night long. All you have to do is text the word elections to 512. 
459-9442 and we will send the link directly to your phone. You don't have to Google it or anything. It'll come right to you. Of course, we'll be back here all night. In fact, what time is it, Quita? Oh, it is about a quarter till nine. That's right. It's 845. We'll be back at nine to share more election results with you.
Thanks for joining us this evening. I'm Quita Culpepper. And I'm Brian Mays. It's been a fun, busy night tonight. We're here to bring you the very latest election results, but we start tonight at this hour with breaking news. That's right. MJ Hagar has conceded in her race against John Cornyn. Tonight she tweeted, I'm so proud and incredibly grateful for all of your support. Together, we've worked so hard and overcome so much, shattering expectations along the way. We've built a powerful grassroots movement from the ground up, and I know our fight here in Texas is far from over. Again, MJ Hagar conceding in the race against incumbent John Cornyn. Now, with voting results rolling in right now, the Associated Press has named the projected winner in a number of states in the presidential election tonight. That's right. ABC News also confirming a lot of these projections. Former Vice President Joe Biden right now at about 131 electoral votes so far. The President, Donald Trump, with 92 electoral votes as we enter this, the 9 o'clock hour. And, of course, the presidential race hasn't been called in Texas yet. It takes 270 to win, so we'll continue to keep an eye on this. Matthew Watkins with the Texas Tribune, kind enough to spend a few minutes with us here this evening. Thank you so much for being with us tonight. We really appreciate it. Hi, thanks for having me. Well, MJ Hagar has conceded in her race. Republican Senator John Cornyn gets another term in office. What does this say about Texas voters? Well, I think we always kind of believe, those of us have been watching this race closely, that she was going to lag a few points behind Joe Biden in the presidential race. So not a shock to see her concede um, as the numbers are coming in. Uh, you know, it is a fairly close race, closer than what John Cornyn faced when he ran in 2014. And and so, you know, this is this was one of the kind of reaches for Democrats and uh the earliest race that we were seeing kind of called tonight um, that that they, they fell short uh, on election day. Let's talk about the race for president here in the state of Texas. Of course, uh, it seems like every four years the talk of a blue potential takeover in Texas happens. It appears that is not going to be the case, at least not at this early hour. What have you noticed from the early results we've gotten in tonight? Well, we saw this kind of pattern where the big urban counties, the suburban counties were reporting first and you saw Joe Biden in the lead. And as those uh, rural Republican counties have started to come in, uh, President Trump has has jumped back ahead. Okay, it's okay. still too Matthew, close to call. Hang with us just a second. Senator John Cornyn is speaking live. Let's take that real quick. And Matthew, we'll get back to you uh, as soon as he's finished here. Sounds good. It's a historic election for so many reasons. Whether I earned your vote or whether you were pulling for my opponent, I'm honored and committed to serving and representing all Texans. My goal as your United States Senator is simple. Continue to make Texas a place of exceptional opportunity for all. In the next six years, I look forward to our visits, our celebrations, and working together to overcome whatever challenges may come our way. Generations of Texans and Americans have fought for the freedom to make our own choices. I'm honored to serve in Sam Houston's Senate seat. He believed that what was good for Texas was good for America, and I think he was right. Texans are entrepreneurs, cowboys, wildcatters, and astronauts. We're working parents, students, teachers, and immigrants. Whatever hat we wear, we often find that despite our differences, we are united by our core values, faith, family, and freedom. These are the tenets that have made Texas and our nation so successful, and they are what guide me as I work hard to serve 29 million Texans. I'm glad we had this fight. It's a fight for the soul of our nation and our state. Let me close by saying this, serving as your United States Senator has been the privilege of my lifetime. We have accomplished a lot together, but we have more to do. And while we may be separated, we must also now be united. So together, we'll get down the road and we'll work hard to make sure our state continues to be the best place in the world to live, work, and raise a family. Thank you. God bless you, and may God continue to bless the great state of Texas.
And that was U.S. Senator John Cornyn giving his victory speech. He has beaten his opponent, M.J. Hagar, and will continue to serve in his seat. And Matthew, thank you so much for hanging out with us this evening. We were talking a little bit about the presidency, I believe, uh, before John Cornyn started his speech. That's right. And, you know, what we were saying is we've seen Trump take the lead in Texas. It's still too early, but there hasn't been a, you know, uh, projection. Most outlets are still waiting to make a call on Texas. Um, but what we are seeing is Trump in a pretty good position as a lot of the kind of Democratic vote centers have reported their early votes. And you're seeing some of the kind of rural, more Republican leaning counties bring in their votes now into the count. Um, but it is, you know, striking that it is this close on a presidential night in Texas. It's something we haven't seen in a very long time. And uh, it's possible that that Trump number will continue to tick up, but it seems you know, very, very unlikely that it'll be anywhere close to the margin that Trump won in 2016. So you know, some Democrats might be a little disappointed seeing this right now. It, it's progress, but it's, they're gonna need their luck to change tonight uh, for, to kind of get over that hump and, and, and turn the state blue. Well, definitely uh, a race everyone is watching this evening. Matthew Watkins with the Texas Tribune, thank you so much for being with us. Thanks for having me. And Tony Pulhetsky joins us now for a look at the race for Williamson County Sheriff, another race that people just can't seem to not watch tonight, Tony. Absolutely, Quita. I think in Central Texas, this has been a race that many people have been very curious about and curious for a number of reasons. Number one, the incumbent, Sheriff Robert Chody, has a lot of support. He has enjoyed uh, a group of supporters who many of them came to know him through some of his community outreach efforts and, of course, the television show Live PD. During the run of Live PD for about 18 months, People really got to know Robert Chody, and as a result, we saw his social media numbers grow and a lot of support of him grow. But over the past several months, there have been a number of excessive force allegations involving his department. Of course, one of the main ones was the death of Javier Ambler, which we first reported on in June. That led to additional reporting of other use of force incidents. And Quita and Brian, of course, in late September, the sheriff was indicted by a grand jury in his own county on a charge of tampering with evidence relating to live PD video in the death of Javier Ambler. His opponent, Mike Gleason, uh, has worked for the sheriff's office, worked for the sheriff's office for more than two decades, rising through the ranks, retiring there as a uh, chief deputy, an assistant chief deputy. And so the big question has been to what extent was Robert Chody's selection celebrity, if you will, going to propel him through this race uh, in spite of the fact that he does have a criminal indictment. And as of uh, early voting and, and several precincts that have been counted now in Williamson County, you can see that Mike Gleason has a commanding lead over Sheriff Robert Chody. Uh, Gleason having about 140,000 votes compared to Chody's 106,000 votes. About 25,000 people voted in Williamson County today. And as I said earlier, uh, if you took all of those votes and applied them to uh, Robert Chody's uh, vote count, if every single voter today voted for Robert Chody, it would be still very difficult for him to make up the deficit with Mike Gleason. Brian and Quita, one thing I do want to point out, though, uh, is that Robert Chody spent about $1.2 million, most of that of his own money on his campaign for Williamson County Sheriff, a number that experts say is really unheard of. People who may not know this, Robert Chody won the largest ever Texas lottery in 2001, taking home about $52 million. But again, his race tonight seeming to uh, be going to Mike Gleason, his opponent, in what has been a very interesting race to follow.
No doubt Sheriff Chuddy with some ground to make up as they tabulate those votes cast today. Tony Plohetsky following in Williamson County Force. Tony, thank you very much for that. Let's take a look at some other results uh, that we're getting in here this evening. Some numbers coming in. We're updating these as soon as we get them in. Let's start with the local races, some local propositions on the ballot in Travis County and within the city of Austin. Of course, Prop A we've talked a lot about here on the evening. Uh, this is the property tax increase for transit. 58% voting in favor of that here in the city of Austin, 42% against. Again, now we're into today's vote. You can see about 4% reporting, so that's including the early vote and some of the votes cast today. Prop B, about 4% in. This is $460 million in bonds for mobility, also in the city of Austin. Overwhelmingly in favor of that, the voters say 68% right now, with again, just under 5% reporting at this hour. Let's talk about some congressional races. This for congressional seat in District 11, Austin Pfluger. Uh, this, of course, was the, the uh, seat held by Mike Conaway. He retired. Uh, this is Lano and Mason County. Goes all the way out to Midland, in fact. Right now, significant lead. In fact, the seat is going to go to Austin Pfluger, according to our check mark there. 79% of the vote, the Republican will hold that seat uh, for Congressional District 11. Let's talk about some other Congress uh, seats here, some congressional seats. This is District 35. Incumbent is Lloyd Doggett. He will go back to Washington to represent District 35. Of course, this includes parts of Travis County and to the south, 67% of the vote with just over half reporting now, 53%. District 48, the congressional seat here, this is, excuse me, the state representative, District 48, Donna Howard, uh, the incumbent, the Democrat there, 71% of the vote uh, with about 61% reporting, Quita. So you can see there some other ones to go through. District 49, uh, looks like uh, Gina Hinojosa, the incumbent, uh, will hold that seat with 80% of the vote here uh, in tonight as we look towards some other results from you. That's right. Let's take a look. We're going to continue on with those Texas House results. State dis represented with District 50, the incumbent Celia Israel, 70 percent, an extremely commanding lead over Larry De La Rose, her opponent. And in District 51, the incumbent Eddie Rodriguez, another commanding lead tonight, 84 percent over his Republican challenger, Robert Reynolds. All right, of course, if you'd like the very latest results, we would love to get that to you. All you have to do is text the word elections, 512-459-9442, and we will send the link directly to your phone. That's right, and coming up tonight on KV News at 10, we're going to keep following all of the latest local and national election results, and we will see you back here then. Have a great night.